I think the general public sees the stereotypical pot smoker as a very lazy person. You always hear the uh, living in mom's basement story, won't get a job, um, can't face life, all of that stuff. For myself and Melissa in our business, we find that that's quite the opposite. The image we're trying to set here is that um, you can come right in this door. We're very friendly and we want to discuss anything about marijuana, medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, hemp, the history, uh, how this became vilified by the United States government, where we think it's going. We're trying to set an image of friendliness, openness and knowledge. Knowledge is key. We have a place right alongside the pharma pharmacological companies, and we actually think we do a lot more good than harm. Used properly, cannabis is a very uh, adds to a very healthy lifestyle. So on a daily basis, we try and talk to the person who doesn't know anything about cannabis. That first introduction should be um, the truth. It should be that you know nine out of ten of us are very intelligent, very mellow very caring people and we're just trying to uh, fit into a society that has labeled us as things we're not. Michael and I have known each other for over 30 years. By the time I was about 14, I met Michael, just in passing. We reconnected later when I was 17 years old. We've been together for 32, 33 years now. I couldn't function today uh, without cannabis because of the tumor that I actually got in my head when I was 37. I, I sl slammed right off a wall. I couldn't even walk. Um, I couldn't see straight anymore. I still have difficulty seeing more than 10 feet. Everything jumps. Without a cookie, I, I literally go sideways. When I walk like I'm drunk, I, I keep my balance only with the cannabis. It's the only thing keeping my balance. And it also, I use it as an anti-emetic. I would be vomiting a couple of times a day. Uh, from dizziness, I'm always dizzy. Lightheaded is 99% of the day, and dizzy is some of it. Even though I can think clearly, I'm, it's like I'm a little confused. I'm a little slower in my, in my thoughts, even though I know clearly in my head what I want to say. My tongue doesn't move as fast as my brain does anymore. Without the cannabis, I feel way more lightheaded, and I can't function well at all. With the cannabis, I work 16-hour days. Not easy, but I couldn't do it otherwise. And uh, when I saw how much that helped me, that it put me back on my feet, literally put me back on my feet, I had to go more towards this. I had to um, move towards this movement even more. We were going to train people just to work that were in wheelchairs at first, because uh, when I was first down, I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm going to be on Social Security the rest of my life, and I'm going to be relying on the state. And that is oh so not me. We decided that you know, I could still, even in a wheelchair, get around a four by eight ebb and flow table, which is a grow table, and teach people how to be self-sufficient, make their own medicine. Michael having incredible problems for his whole 30 years, but always appearing so incredibly healthy. I mean, he's amazing. That, he does, he's never done an aspirin. None of that, you know, and I feel like every day I'm like, I'm tired, my back hurts. And he's like, broken back, broken collarbone, no knees, let's go, <laughs> tumor in his head. So he is really inspirational. I moved along, became a grower. Melissa and I uh, out in California had um, some excess cannabis at times and we would always share. So we just, you know, really got into the spirit of the movement of cannabis which is to not be uh, a selfish corporate type of person. It's the stereotype that I would prefer we see as a very caring person. So that when I saw that I was a really good grower and that I could outproduce most people and that there was an excess in California because of the lovely climate and, and just the, the relaxed atmosphere to allow somebody like myself to do what they do, uh, we could help a lot of people. We could help a lot of people. Melissa and I noticed that, you know, sometimes our efforts weren't going to the right places. 
when you're a grower and sending things places, you don't see the end result and you don't know actually if things ever get to where you'd like to see them get. So over the years, we've talked about becoming more street level active, getting right back to the people, making sure that anything I do, I'm looking at that person. The school was always in our mind, education was always in our mind, teaching people how to do the cannabis movement. Long ago, when these ancient Grecian temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years, even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. For centuries prior to about 1850, all the ships that sailed the Western Seas were rigged with hemp and rope and sails. For the sailor, no less than the hangman, hemp was indispensable. People don't understand that hemp, the industrial hemp plant, was used as an oil, a food, a paper product, a clothing product, all through the 16th, 17th, and 1800s. It was more valuable than what we have as oil now. It controlled everything. It was the largest crop anywhere in the world. And it seems like that has been forgotten. <laughs> All such plants will presently be turning out products spun from American-grown hemp. Twine of various kinds for tying, winding armatures, and upholsterers work. Rope for marine rigging and towing, for hay forks, derricks, and heavy-duty tackle. Most people think all of a sudden that we've gotten this marijuana from 1969 at Woodstock, but an awful lot happened in between the time it was the most valuable used product in the world and how it was outlawed. Hemp is a very labor-intensive um, product to grow. So it was a lot of slave labor that was involved in this. So when slavery ended, it really started to slow down because Eli Whitney and the cotton gin had come on. So cotton had become a more valuable product and easier to manufacture. So people started moving away from the hemp industry. As things moved along and we had the Industrial Revolution, what happened was the people who were going to come up with the chemical companies and make the different products for the 1900s decided they needed to get rid of hemp. It was going to be their competitor. Hemp could be used uh, to replace any kind of paper products. This was about eliminating a very valuable competition and introducing something new to the world. So, let's go through a little bit of politics today. We left you last week with the 1937 Marijuana Tax Stamp Act being passed. In the middle of the night, not before both houses of Congress, but before the House Ways and Means Committee, so that they didn't have to debate this fully. Uh, this was snuck through, prepared in secret for two years, without ever asking the American Medical Association for their opinion on this. They used the tax revenue power of government. Because the government didn't outlaw cannabis, they put a prohibitive tax on it. So they kept it vilified, and they didn't want people bringing back the hemp. Right away, we had the LaGuardia, report that came out in 1942. Fiorino LaGuardia was the mayor of New York City. Now, he noticed right away that something was going wrong here. You know, whether he was a cannabis user or not, I have no idea. But he seemed to jump on this right away and say, wait a minute, there's, there's something wrong here. Let's take a look at this plant. Why are we outlawing it like this? He conducted a five-year study. New York Academy of Sciences did it. And it came back disproving everything that the government had said. That report went and acted on by the government. And it was actually said by Harry Ainslinger, the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, who has no ba uh, background in science, that it was an unscientific study. So a law enforcement agent said uh, it was <clears throat> not to be looked at again. So nobody went against what he said for almost 30 years. It wasn't looked at again until the Schaefer Commission report that Richard Nixon asked to have done in 1970. And that was because Timothy Leary had gotten cannabis made legal. For one brief second in 1969, the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act was thrown out of court because it asked you to go buy a, a stamp stating you were going to do something illegal. Richard Nixon was watching this and started something called the Controlled Substance Act. He did, did that in 1970, which took every drug in the world, legal and illegal, and put it into five schedules. Cannabis was put in the schedule of drugs that is the worst in the world. 
that can't be trusted with doctors to use, even under medical supervision, you can't use cannabis. And, and Richard Nixon said, we'll put it in Schedule 1 until we do a study. So he asked his friend, uh, Governor Ray Schaefer of Pennsylvania, to do a study. And the title was, Marijuana, a Signal of Misunderstanding. Richard Nixon read that and dropped it right in the wastebasket without even looking at it. So again, that's our second study that the United States government conducted, taxpayers paid for, and it came back disproving again everything the government had stated in 1937. People started looking at this, this drug a little bit differently. States started to decriminalize it, and then Jimmy Carter came along, and he actually looked at it. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana, leaving the states free to adopt whatever laws they wish concerning marijuana. At a House hearing today, the Carter administration favored easing the penalties they face for that use. We have yet to find a serious medical consequence related to marijuana smoking. Just one more question. But Somewhat to my surprise, we have not found serious health consequences in approximately $20 million of research in the last five years. But the thing that we do know, though, is that we will be saving the lives and careers of a lot of young people that would otherwise be destroyed by maintaining criminal penalties and putting people in jail for possession. It was more harmful giving somebody the fine or jail time for cannabis than the actual offense of smoking the joint. And in some states, it is still years. Even with a small amount of cannabis, you could be in some states and get numbers of years in jail not for selling cannabis, but for having it. When Ronald Reagan came into office, he outright lied about things. He actually said smoking one joint was the equivalent in brain damage to being on Bikini Island during the Hiroshima bombing. I got some good pot for you. No. Cocaine? No, thanks. Yo, my man, you want some nudes? No way. If someone offers you drugs, instead of saying something you really don't mean, just say, no. But the Just Say No program that Nancy Reagan and he had put out um, started really sending things backwards for us again. And they really vilified everything about cannabis for the next number of years. So it's been an up-down battle for the past 75 years. We have a woman who has a tumor in her head. And um, she was caught using cannabis by Brigham and Women's. And they gave her the choice of pain medication or cannabis. And she said, well, the cannabis gets me to feel better, and I'm really hooked on the pain medication. So she said no to the pain medication, and she's supposed to be, have neurosurgery on Friday. They canceled the neurosurgery and said she should see a psychiatrist because she chose cannabis over the pain medication. When you tell somebody to go home, no medication, because you're using cannabis, it was disgusting. The Department of Public Health has put people in charge of our medicine who A, don't understand it, B, it goes against everything they've been taught. The people who really need the help aren't getting it. I, we never know what our day is gonna bring. We never know. I deal sometimes with four or five cancer patients a day who don't understand cannabis at all, but they've heard something. I've heard something. Tell me what, can this save me? People are desperate, they're being taken advantage of. We need true information out there and the Department of Public Health and the hospitals need to realize this. I, being a nurse for tons of years, have seen unbelievable side effects of the medications I've had to give that it would literally kill me inside. You know, I just knew that this is not the right thing for me to be doing. My cousin was misdiagnosed a year ago. About maybe three months ago, I got a phone call saying that she has liver cancer. And at that point, it was 75% of her liver. And at this point, they told her she wasn't going to live at all for any holidays. I immediately called Mike, who is amazing, has amazing knowledge about it, and has been helping me with some oils for her to take. She actually was able to get up in the morning on Thanksgiving for a couple hours and was able to stay up four or five hours with her company and ate a dinner. Now that is just, and I don't want to get overly excited, but I'm excited.
it's going to be a matter of a few more years. Slowly but surely, it won't be Melissa and I doing this. It will be doctors. Um, that's who needs to do it, doctors and nurses. And we need to educate them and get them moving forward on this because there's so much need. We're, uh, we like to say we're always a work in progress because Michael and I are like this. We've only been here for two years and every day it's like, what's the plan? And then we implement it. As you can see, we never even finished painting the walls and yet here we are. We're in school. We're just about education and that mission is still unfolding. It could be a million things. I wouldn't really want to be so presumptuous as to say that for anyone else, I wouldn't. It's changed me. Right? It's changed our life. It's a really great thing. And it does, it makes us really happy. <laughs>